All right, welcome everybody. Good to see everybody. So I'm Katie Salem. For those that I don't know, I think I probably know everybody in the room, but it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Marcelo um, to give a talk to us today in our seminar. Um, I think that Marcelo has one of the most interesting appointments, this combination of words you rarely find together, I think, in many universities. So he's assistant professor of learning sciences and computer science at the Northwestern School of Education and Social, Social Policy in the School of Engineering. Okay, so those, those disciplines in our university do not sit together. So it's really wonderful um, that Marcella has an opportunity to sit at this very kind of intersectional department, multidisciplinary department. So Marcelo, I was thinking of keywords to describe him. If, uh, so one is inclusivity. He's going to talk a lot about that idea and how it's informed his work. And I think particularly you're going to talk about um, some tangible works today. Uh, Tilt. So that's the name of the lab that he runs at Northwestern that he's going to talk about. Uh, good human. He's a wonderful human being, very busy. He supervises 12 PhD students. 15 undergraduate students, a postdoc, and also has a very active family life. So I'm just like in awe um, of the busyness. Um, and I got turned on to Marcella's work because he's been doing some work, has been doing some work in Minecraft with multimodal interfaces for um, players that are blind um, or sensory impaired in some other way. So super interesting work. Um, and we are just very privileged to have you today. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really excited to be here. Um, so we're going to try a few different things today. Some of them might not work well, some of them hopefully will. Uh, there will be some audience participation requested at different portions during this, uh, this talk. So, um, yeah, be, be ready for that. Uh, so today you can talk about designing for inclusivity and ultimately, um, really to get at this idea to, for us to start to think about inclusion and inclusivity spanning a lot of different things, right? It has to touch on things related to content, related to um, the actual technological interfaces that are used, the design practice, the pedagogic strategies, uh, class policies, and more. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an overview of the research that my lab does, so TILT, um, and really thinking about the ways that we do work to try to design inclusive learning uh, environments, to develop different sorts of multiple interfaces, and then to also leverage um, ethical, as well as sort of student-centered uh, data mining techniques. And a lot of this is going to be situated in the context of a project that I called SportSense, uh, and hopefully that'll help to serve as sort of an exemplar, an example of the ways that we're really trying to think about the various layers of designing for inclusivity. All right, so first going to introduce you guys to uh, my lab, as you've heard. Um, I've got a, a pretty large lab. Um, this is not all the people in the lab, uh, but the lab is called TILT, Technological Innovations for Inclusive Learning and Teaching. On the left hand, on the right hand side are a number of undergraduate students. Uh, some of them have, have recently graduated, so I haven't updated all their pictures yet, um, but here's just a collection of undergraduate students who work with me throughout, throughout last year as well as into this year. And then on the left hand side, you are seeing my graduate students. So uh, pretty much all those students are PhD students, excluding my uh, postdoc, Vishesh Kumar, who is seen pictured on the bottom, bottom row, uh, three, three in. Um, but these, I really wanna, wanna recognize these people because these are the people that I work with. These are in many, many respects, uh, the thought partners that I have and, um, the people who are really trying to push a lot of this, a lot of this, this work forward. So, really excited to be a part of this, uh, a part of this, this community, and to be able to share some of this work with you all today. So, today, I called the talk "Designing for Inclusivity," um, and my lab is called "Technological Innovations for Inclusive Learning and Teaching." And you know, this actually kind of came up during the lunch I was having with the graduate students. But like, what do we mean by inclusion? What do we mean by inclusivity? Um, and at times, you know, there's broadly these terms, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, that I feel like at times we kind of throw them out there uh, without a very clear understanding of what it means, or more importantly, what it actually means for the work that we're doing. 
Um, so part of what I want to do today is talk to you guys a little bit about how I've been thinking about uh, inclusion. Um, and to kick this off, we're going to test out, we're going to set up the first demo. We'll see how, how this goes. Um, one of the things I'm going to going to show, and I'm not going to have tons of time to actually talk about how it works and, and everything, um, but we're going to test out one of the platforms my lab has been working on, a platform called Blink, which is short for Building Literacy and In-Person Collaboration. So I'm going to navigate to the Blink webpage, which is tilt-blink.com. And I will ask you guys to take out your devices and also uh, log in. Well, you're not going to log in. I'll show you what you guys can do in just a second. So Tilt, this Blink platform was really developed because we wanted to think about ways to study and support collaboration um, and really find ways for teams to think about how they're collaborating with one another. Um, so big picture, the Blink platform allows people to, um, I say record, but essentially listen in on conversations that are going on within small groups and then subsequently provide transcripts of that, as well as some sort of keywords and, and other things. Um, so today, as the first sort of activity, I'm going to ask you guys to engage in a small discussion around what you think inclusion is and how you think about leveraging that within your practices. Um, but to get that started, I'm going to create a new discussion, and we're going to call this UCI. I will say next. I'm going to use a keyword list, so I'm going to use this inclusion list, and I'm going to say start discussion. Now, you all will go to tilt-blink.com and say join discussion. Here, it's going to ask for a name. Now, let me be clear, you don't have to put your name. You can put whatever set of characters you'd like in here. Uh, so I'm going to say me, and then what you put in the lower corner is, or in the lower box is 2MD0. So I'm going to put in here 2MD0. So where it said passcode. And we'll just use the audio. There's, we have this set up so you can collect video data uh, also, but it should work if I press join discussion. So now I've joined this discussion and it's providing me this sort of representation of the conversation. So we'll come back to this. Don't worry about it for now. Uh, get it, just get it started. And again, the join was 2MD0. And if I go and click in here, I see we've got me, Carrot, Matthew, Pancake. So we have a handful of people. Um, and we're also already starting to see some of the transcripts, transcripts showing up within the interface. Um, so what is you guys going to be talking about? We're only going to take a couple minutes to do this. Uh, I would like for you all to turn the person next to you or someone around you nearby and think about this question. What does it mean to design an inclusive learning environment? And particularly in the context of computer science. Um, so just take a moment, turn to each other and talk for a second. Yes, there's a question. Oh, uh, MD, M, capital E. I'll let me go back to the uh, page. Uh, sorry, 2MD0. 2MD0, it's this thing up in the upper right-hand corner. So we'll take just like, like two or three minutes and talk to the person next to you. Yeah, 2MD0. I'll put this in the chat. Are we? Are we? Does that mean we're confused? All right. Well, what do you think about the uh, comment? What do you think about designing? So, yeah, take two minutes. Take two minutes. Talk to the person next to you. <laughs> Really have 
All right, take like 30 more seconds, 30 more seconds. All right, ten second warning. All right, let's bring it back. Okay, it's set to screen. That's fine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll put everything on that one. Good stuff. All right. So thank you guys for uh, uh, for participating in that. Uh, we're gonna go and look at that a little bit more in like eight to nine slides, I think. Um, but wanted to give you guys, you know, one. I don't know how much how much this is a question that you guys have thought about as a department or as a school. Um, but want you guys to start to reflect on this and start to think about what does it look like? What what did we what do we really mean when we're thinking about designing these inclusive learning uh, learning environments? So to start, start to situate this, um, I like to think about a few different aspects of inclusion. And within my work, I really look at three broad areas. So one of them is thinking about multimodal learning um, and thinking about a variety of types of many times, you know, hands-on engaging, some would say expansive learning, learning spaces. Uh, think about multiple interfaces. So as we develop these spaces where people might be doing hands-on activities, 
what are the variety of modalities that we might make available for people to engage in those engage with those activities and then finally multimodal analytics um, which is really to say that if we really if we are really encouraging expansive ways of encouraging learning and recognizing the multimodality of ways of how people might go about engaging in learning we also want to be equally as expansive in the ways that we go about studying learning uh, it can be a little bit disingenuous to tell someone that they're going to go through a learning experience that's really really hands-on and engaging and then give them a very standard uh, pre-post test, for example, uh, to really try to think about using multimodal learning analytics, multimodal data mining, so that we can investigate the learning processes and start to look at the ways and really find ways to characterize and identify the learning that's taking place. More specifically, you know, when I think about breaking these things down in, in conjunction with inclusion, multimodal learning, you know, a lot of it really has to do with what is it that students are learning? What is the content that they're engaging with? Um, how are they learning that, that content? Is it them just being expected to sit down and read through a textbook or are they really supported as they engage in perhaps collaborative experiences? And then also how is the experience connected to the learner's identity? How are we providing ways for their identity to be elevated within that learning environment? When I think about multiple interfaces, really think about what are the tools that are available to support learning? What are the ways that we are finding, what are the ways that we can align the tools with the learner's needs and with the learner's goals? And then subsequently with multimodal learning analytics, um, how might we, we measure learning in ways that are using multimodal data that are not just relying on, again, uh, perhaps a paper and pencil test or on someone's ability to orate in front of a group of uh, participants, as well as how can we think about making the analytics relevant to all stakeholders? That it's not just about um, researchers coming into a space and mining data from an organization or from a group of participants. How do we also think about ways that students are able to leverage that data to learn about their own learning or teachers might be able to leverage that data. So these are some of the ways that I think about um, inclusion. And this is some of the ways that I try to investigate inclusion within the work that, uh, that I do. And in the next, next uh, set of slides, going to briefly mention two projects that are going to touch on multimodal um, interfaces, multimodal and analytics, and then move into um, a more in-depth discussion around uh, the SportsSense project. But broadly speaking, I, you know, I think about these three areas working in concert with one another, um, really being there to be able to, to, to support, support the other. Um, so one of, when I think about multiple interfaces, one of the things I'm going to talk about is a, a cyber an NSF cyber learning project that recently um, concluded around developing multiple interfaces for the, the Minecraft game. Just um, by a show of hands or, or some other uh, expression, how many of you all know what Minecraft is? Okay, this looks like most of the room. Um, for those who don't, this is sort of the picture of Minecraft environment. Minecraft is uh, sort of a, a, a virtual reality game where participants are oftentimes either in first person or third person, and they engage in a number of activities um, that is oftentimes akin to sort of like a virtual Lego. So you go through the process of mining, building, um, as well as just sort of exploring the different types of, of virtual worlds. The idea behind Multicraft uh, was really that we wanted to find ways to make this game experience uh, more accessible to particularly with students with disabilities. So there's a, um, a lot of this came about to visiting a middle school classroom and then came across a student who had cerebral palsy and that student was ultimately excluded from, from playing Minecraft from with, with, with the rest of students in, in his class. Um, so this sort of motivated us to think about how can we set up an interface, especially with the current state of various speech, gaze, gesture-based input devices, how can we set up a platform that it will facilitate um, and I call it equitable play within the Minecraft experience? So not just replicate the existing modalities of using a keyboard and mouse, but actually foster uh, a sort of e equitable play. So what we eventually came up with is the sort of architecture that includes a number of different multimodal input devices. Um, so the most sort of foundational ones that we have within this platform are speech. So a user being able to verbalize instructions into the game. And we really try to make this as, uh, as natural, as naturalistic as possible. So a student could say something, a participant could play, say something on the lines of build a five by seven by eight gold structure 
Um, and the game would create that structure for the user uh, in, in, in real time. You could also do things like tell the game that they want to navigate, moving forward, moving left, moving right, uh, et cetera. Essentially providing a way for speech to be the primary mode of input um, for playing the game. We also have uh, the ability to use eye tracking. So this is using either a standalone piece of hardware, an eye tracker, or using a web camera. And combining, um, well, there's two things with this. One with the, with the eye tracker, you can actually navigate. So it's based on where someone's looking, we can actually have the game move the player to that location. But we also have ways for doing multimodal fusion, which is someone can make an instruction, say, make a seven by four by five gold structure here, and it'll create that structure where the player is, is currently looking. So those are two examples of trying to use uh, the sort of multimodal inputs to reduce the requirement, the need to use the standard inputs of a keyboard and mouse. The other two that we have mentioned on here, one of them is using uh, wooden blocks, uh, which I actually show you a quick video of a prototype of that in just a second. Um, and then EEG, which is EEG has been much more experimental. Um, so there's a low cost Muse headset that someone can, can put on. And one thing we looked at was training some algorithms to be able to, to detect things like wandering or exploring or mining well within the game to look at that as a possibility. Um, but so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about this, but this is to give you an example of a multiple interface that is really here to try to support learning and engagement within the context of, of, uh, of, of Minecraft. So here's just a quick video of um, one of the recent prototypes of what we've been doing within, within uh, Multicraft, thinking about those wooden blocks. So what you're going to see in just a moment is on the right-hand side, a uh, student placing blocks. Um, and then on the left-hand side, you'll see those blocks start to appear within the game environment. So here they place two blocks, this purple block and the green block. And in the back left-hand corner over here, you're seeing those show up in real time. Then they place two more blocks and those two blocks will again show up within the game environment. This approach of trying to bring tangibles into play um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons why this offers some important benefits. And one of them is just being able to provide a different level of collaboration. Um, oftentimes you find youth are playing Minecraft by themselves. And sometimes parents want to get in on them. Parents want to start to engage with them. And so that type of collaboration that can take place looks different when it is two people or three people trying to sit at a computer screen, uh, perhaps, and if it's youth jostling over a keyboard and mouse versus being able to sit, or sit around a shared space where they are using uh, tangible blocks with one another. We also really thought about, about TangiCraft or this multi-craft version using tangible blocks um, to support blind users, users that are either blind or, or low vision. Uh, so they have tactile components that they can in interact with that, um, that are also giving them some level of, of feedback. So this is one of the examples of, the, uh, of one of the input modalities with, with multi-craft. In conjunction with this, we also did some work around eye tracking. Uh, I won't go into tons of detail about this, but as students are engaging with the game environment and maybe using our eye tracking for input, we can also uh, record eye tracking data and start to look at their spatial reasoning practices. So for example, in this specific image, um, we would have asked a student to replicate these, uh, this existing structure in the actual game environment and start to see what are the visual cues that they're paying attention to when they're looking at this, at this portfolio. And so just an example of how we can go about trying to mine student spatial reasoning and looking at their spatial reasoning practice in the context of this game environment, but using the eye gaze modality that we have already incorporated within to the multi-craft platform. So part of what we really want to do is start to couple these ways of studying learning with actual ways for affording improved gameplay and facilitating the, um, the, the design process. Um, so one of the, you know, multi-craft is really about trying to connect between accessibility needs. That's really what, that's really what drove the project first and foremost, um, but also in ways that help us get a better sense and help us study student computational thinking, as well as their spatial reasoning. Um, so just broadly speaking, you know, I really think about multiple input as a way to open up new possibilities for inclusive and equitable learning, while also facilitating the practice of, of complex skills. In this case, uh, ways for them to practice um, spatial reasoning and computational thinking. As I noted though, these things can also be used to study and support learning. And to kind of talk about that a little bit more, uh, I'm gonna transition now to Blink. So Blink is the platform that I just, uh, you guys all sort of logged onto. 
And part of the idea with Blink is that AI can provide techniques and technologies that allow you or users to learn about their learning. Um, Blink really starts to answer this question of what does good collaboration look like? But importantly, what does it look like from the student perspective? So part of what we really want to get at is how are, you know, many of you and our students, what are the things you guys want to know about your collaboration? What is it you want to learn about how you are collaborating and how you would want to improve your collaborative process? Uh, and so a lot of what we've, we've been incorporating into the Blink platform is really trying to reflect that. What are the things that students care about knowing as it relates to um, how they're collaborating? Whether it's keeping track of the things they've talked about, and whether it's looking at the, uh, the level of participation of different people within the group, whether it's keeping track of the emotional tone or the, or the climate of, that, of those conversations. All those are pieces that we've tried to add into, um, add into the Blink platform. So I'm going to quickly click back into Blink so you guys can actually see what some of these things are. So here we're looking at Panda. And Panda, you don't need to identify yourself. Um, and what the, what the Blink platform tries to do is be able to give sort of a, a summary of what's happened within a given group. So here at the very top, you see a discussion timeline. Uh, you can click into a discussion timeline, and it will pull open this information about that, uh, about that transcript at the time. You can subsequently go see a full set of that transcript of, of what the system thinks it heard. Um, none of this information is actually recorded. Well, the only thing that we end up recording is the transcript itself. And we also notice that um, there's no real labels on these things. We don't actually know who in each group who actually said these different things. The students in the group will know that because they have awareness of that context. But for someone else who maybe is coming to look at the data, they don't have that information. And part of that is intentional with this platform um, because we want, to, uh, we want to honor some level of, of privacy and really encourage people to think about things from a group level. How is it that the group is collaborating with one another? Some of the other things that you maybe saw in this interface um, was things like keywords. So you can think about the context. Is there a question? Oh, yeah, sure. Let's do this. So these are keywords that I put in beforehand. That I was, these are words that I was curious to see when they would kind of come up. Uh, and so what it will, what the platform will do is just sort of have provide a listing of those keywords so that I can actually go and click and see where those keywords were used um, in, in context. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why we ended up um, incorporating that, but some of the some of the feedback we've gotten from people who would potentially use the platform is that they want to have access to those keywords. The most controversial part of this, which I won't get into tons, is the sort of the discussion features at the bottom, um, which tries to do some level of sentiment analysis based on the text um, and give some indicators around what have been termed emotional tone and look thinking and clout. These are loosely based on some of James Penny Baker's work on the uh, using the linguistic inquiry word count. Um, but these are also things that can be heavily, heavily customized based on the specific context. There's a number of other components in here. There's topic modeling. Um, there's direction of arrival. There's also another representation, which is this graph structure that can sort of show the transcripts from the text from a number of groups at the same time, highlight things like questions um, so that people can get a high level of the, of the conversation. But so this is an example of where we're really trying to think about how can we leverage analytics to support students to support their collaborative process, while at the same time, perhaps help us as researchers um, start to make sense of how students are, uh, are, are collaborating. And I will end this discussion for now. Okay. Um, so, so broadly speaking with Blink, this idea that AI and multiple analytics can help us think about how we learn to collaborate and increase collaboration, collaboration quality. Um, and got a couple of different papers that have sort of tried to talk through some of the design of this type of, of a platform. Um, there's a number of other features with the platform. One is that you guys were logging in with your own devices so that you actually control what gets recorded and what does not get recorded. That is also something that is intentional. We don't want to set up the sort of this, uh, this big brother system um, where everyone's data is constantly getting mined and they don't even know about it. Um, and there's also the idea that, you know, some contracts like collaboration are probably something that necessitates some level of computational tools and those are not going to help us support. Them. All right, the main thing I'm going to end up talking about over the, the next 10, 15 minutes or so is this uh, thinking about multimodal learning and really connected to the affordances of designing multimodal, uh, 
how designing multimodal technology can offer generous space for people to engage in learning. And this is really going to be in the context of a project called um, called SportSense. Um, SportSense is connected to two current NSF grants. Uh, one of them is NSF Career Award, and where I'm currently in the, the second year of that, um, after having just conducted a number of interviews with, uh, with student athletes at the high school level, and these things eventually moving into looking at multimodal analysis within, um, within these sorts of contexts, which I'll explain more. It's also connected to a research practice partnership, uh, NSF CS for All, where we are bridging computational thinking and, um, and PE class. So students are designing different types of apps and wearables in their coding class to use within their PE class, uh, which is starting to open up some neat conversations between uh, students and their PE teachers, as well as students uh, and their, their coding teachers. So part of this project, part of the inspiration for this project is that uh, there's some researchers did a study of computer science students in LAUSD and asked them about what are their other interests. Um, within that sample, only 6%, probably 6% of the computer science students indicated having an interest in sports. And so part of this is to say that there seems to be an opportunity of, of engaging a population of students who is not currently represented within, well, within computer science. And that's one of the sort of the goals behind uh, the SportsSense project. Um, big picture, really trying to bridge between sports and computer science and let people see the ways that these things can be used in concert with one another. And it's really fundamentally about shifting how people think about computer science allow them to bring an interest and identity in sports to computer science and help them leverage computer science to support their athletic performance. All right, this is all great. These are all words, but what is this actual project? What's it look like? Um, the project consists of a series of, uh, a series of, of modules. And the first one, does anybody recognize this? Who, who, who? Miles Morales, right? Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Um, this is actually how we introduced the idea of sensors. So one of the things we found is that youth oftentimes, when you start talking about digital sensors, they are kind of like, what is that? It seems like it can seem like something that is foreign and, and, and not related to them. So we actually start to ground our discussion of these different types of digital sensors in their own human senses, as well as in something like spider sense, um, that, that many of the different types of digital sensors that are out there are really designed to replicate things that humans can already do. And so that ends up being an important starting point for uh, sort of lowering the barrier to entry, so to speak, and starting to shift the conversation of centers being something that the students don't have a clue about to now being something that, that one, they sort of are the prototype of and that they have all these centers that are part of, a part of, their, uh, a part of their, their person. We also have a discussion around, some discussion around accessibility and ableism in the context of this power of senses um, unit that we, do, that we do with students. And I'll say throughout the, Throughout this curriculum, there's a number of different pieces where we're talking about sports and disability, talking about sports and race, sports and gender, sports and nationality, um, and sort of this, this broad, broad spectrum of, of ideas connected to, uh, to inclusion. The second one, the second unit that we look at is the promise of wearables and thinking about uh, what different types of physical computing devices we might be able to be able to utilize and design and build with. And then we get on to a unit that we call Take Off That Silly Watch, which is really letting students think about computer vision and thinking about ways that you can start to study um, movement and, and engagement and interaction uh, without having to use explicit wearable devices. Uh, we have another set, another module on the limitations of sensors and wearables. We're fairly intentional about discussing like many of the harms that are introduced by using computational uh, approaches or using algorithms. Um, and the ways that at times, you know, people end up being criminalized through these different types of algorithms. Um, we also talk about ways that people can go about trying to, uh, to, to hack or trick um, these different platforms. So here's an example of an app that's trying to look at, uh, trying to be able to count the number of push-ups somebody is doing. Um, and subsequently, you know, this person realizes, well, they can just kind of flop over and suddenly be able to get is you know as many push-ups as they 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 could want. So I'll start to talk about some of these limitations um, within these different with the within these these different technologies. And yes, the this other I don't know if that's a sibling or what. He definitely has a fun time um, with that. 
Um, we also talk about different designers. So we take students through a number of different design thinking activities. Uh, here's just one of them where the students think about a, a given invention and do so using comics. Uh, and so it's like, okay, let's come up with this sort of this comedic sketch around a piece of, of technology um, that someone might want to build. And then we also uh, try to do work to elevate the work of different uh, people of color who have engaged within the design, design space. Um, this work takes place in a number of different contexts. So on the left-hand side, you're actually seeing pictures from the uh, curriculum that's going to be implemented uh, in, in all the fifth grade classrooms, all the fifth grade coding classrooms in uh, Evanston starting in March. And then we also think about, we also put together materials uh, as well as wearable devices that students can start to take home and start to engage with their families around. Um, so also thinking about the sort of family connection piece. There's another aspect of our programming that really speaks more to the out of school. We have a pro pro program called the Sports Technology Critic, where each week students are testing out a different sports wearable and essentially being like an online critic for this tech test or for this technology. How well does it work? What does it do well? What, what can do better? How would they go about redesigning that specific piece of technology? Um, and all of this is sort of in the vein of getting to them to start thinking about designing and inventing their own wearables, designing and inventing their own technology. Um, hmm, I might skip this one. So I wanted to actually have a couple people come up and test out this playing possible game ball. Um, this has been like, this has been a really neat partnership that we've had with, uh, with the Baden sports company. So this playing possible game ball has uh, accelerometers and a Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth communication, Bluetooth transceiver inside of it. Um, and there's a number of different games that people play with this ball where it's, you know, two people competing against each other, trying to shake the ball as fast as they can. So one of them is you got to shake the ball with the arm and your, with the ball in your elbows like this. Uh, another one is like a dancing game where you're trying to like keep the rhythm and whatnot. Um, but this has been one of the other entry points for having students start to think about things that they can do by embedding sensors inside of a, uh, of a ball. So if there's time afterwards, or maybe during the reception, if people want to test this out, um, it has definitely been a hit for kids and adults alike. Um, but okay, so what does this have to do with inclusion? So I'm going to suggest that what we've been trying to do with the Sports Sense Project is really trying to look across a variety of layers of uh, inclusion um, that go from content to context, tools, things about collaborators, evaluation, and policy. So I'm going to speak to a couple of these things, um, and then we will have some time for, for, for questions. So in terms of content, you know, I already tried to motivate this idea that we're trying to provide an expansive view of what computer science can be by, one, letting students bring an identity interest in sports to the computer science space and leverage that in conjunction with, uh, with, with, with coding. And they are doing things um, which sometimes might feel foreign to a computer science class. Uh, you're actually up physically moving things around, throwing a ball here or there. Uh, and part of that is facilitated through things like playing possible game ball, also facilitated through things like sensory enabled basketballs, through um, smart bands that sort of help you track your, your shooting form, um, through the inclusion of things like popular media. So in addition to the Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse, we have a number, number of other pieces of media that we incorporate. Um, and so just to say that the actual content of what we developed and thinking about whose identities and whose interests are centered as it relates to the content is one of the, I think, important pieces to think about as we, um, as we think about uh, in inclusion, as well as the types of activities. So, you know, and within a lot of this, there's a lot of, of play that's involved. Play, and it's also many times collaborative. Um, second, oh, actually, one thing I will quickly mention is we also found that when we talk about students being able to potentially like hack something has also been one of the, the, uh, the things that draws people in. So being able to hack like this ball and trick it into thinking that you're doing something that you're, you're really not, similarly with the type of smartwatch device. Context, another one of the things that matters. So here you're seeing picture on the left-hand side, um, the sort of two-dimensional plane that's thinking about uh, one sort of school settings on the left-hand side, um, and then out of school settings in the right-hand side. And then thinking on the bottom here, it's more of a traditional sort of formal classroom space versus the top being more of a physical movement oriented space. And part of what we've been doing is partnering with a wide variety of organizations. Places like boys and girls clubs that run traditional after school programs, um, partnering with 
actual basketball teams. So we recently did a did a, a session with a group of elementary and middle school basketball players right before their actual basketball practice. And other times we're showing up in students coding classes and within their P classes. So the context, the spaces where we actually do this work um, is also something that, that ends up being important. Um, you know, I've shown a picture here of, of students on the left-hand side um, working and engaging in designing some technology in collaboration with one another, but actually laying down on a gym floor. You know, I do this in my sports technology and learning class, uh, one of the classes I teach in Northwestern. And I'll say, when students are sitting down coding in the gym, it looks different than when they're sitting in a traditional classroom, uh, sitting at desks. So there's just ways that the context of where students are engaging in that learning matters um, and sort of signals what is allowed, what type of participation is invited versus not. The tools are something that's also something that, that crucially matters. So um, you look at the, the sort of board on the right-hand side, this looks pretty intimidating. And we, what we find is that people are often intimidated by something like this. So they'll actually take it and only touch it by the corners because they're not sure if they're gonna get shocked. Um, versus embedding technology inside of a ball like this, like people are happy to take the ball and just throw it, right? They're, they're, they're not, they don't have that same level of concern about the technology because it's actually embedded within a form factor that is inviting to them, something that, that they're comfortable with. Um, we've been doing some other work and I'll actually, if there's time during the reception, I'll show you this too. Um, we've been enhancing some tools like Scratch to be able to allow for multiple micro bits to connect to Scratch so that students can make collaborative games, games that are actually taking input from multiple micro bits. So micro bit is a small microcontroller that has accelerometers in it that you can use to communicate with something like the Scratch program environment. Um, and we've been similarly working on an interface to allow for the playing possible game ball, the little purple ball I was showing you, uh, for students to be able to program activities in Scratch, but that are using data from the ball so that it can detect when they shake the ball or when they catch the ball and actually have something happen in Scratch based on that. Um, and this partnership with Botan has been fun. Um, you know, in part, we, it took us a while to be able to get access to the API, but so far we're the only, we're, we've been the only people outside of Microsoft who's been able to get access to this API. So this is something that we're actually super, super excited about being able to, to do. Other point is, is around collaborators. So a lot of this work around sports sense isn't done in partnership with different organizations. So with school districts, um, I mentioned the Boys and Girls Club, uh, partnership with the Chicago Bulls, Chicago Fire, libraries, city colleges, um, Motorola, as well as Motorola's uh, Solutions Foundation. Um, collaborators play a big, big role in this too, because it's one thing for us from an academic institution to come and show up and engage with youth in, in one of these spaces. It's something different when you have somebody from the community who ends up being the face of those experiences. Um, so just one of the other things to think about of, of when thinking about inclusion and sort of whose identities and interests are centered. And then policy. So I'm not sure what the situation is at, at um, here, I've taught the sports technology learning class in Northwestern three different times. The first two times I had very few student athletes in the class. Um, I did some interviews with the students and turned out that if you don't, if depending on when you schedule your class, you may be very unlikely to have a student, student athlete. So when I shifted my class time to go from 1230 until two, the number of student athletes basically quadrupled from about four to almost 20. Um, so for us to start to think about the policies that we set up as being important for indicating who can participate uh, and, and who can't. Um, and the ones, the pictures, the things you see pictured here are actual projects um, that were done with, uh, with student athletes who are participating within, within, within the class. Um, and then lastly, evaluation. I won't go tons into, into the evaluation, but the, eval the ways that we go about evaluating the learning within these spaces also matters. And this is partially here, just give you, give, give, give you all a scale uh, some scope around the, um, yeah, give you a sense of the scale of the work. You know, we have worked with more than 3,000 participants throughout the Chicagoland area, as well as in other spaces and across a wide variety of contexts. Um, and, you know, big picture, we definitely see some shifts. We see some shifts in how people think about computer science, both in general, as well as how they see computer science in relationship to themselves and recognizing uh, computer science as something that could be fun and for the community. Um, and now I'll just end with a couple of these quotations. Um, this, is a, this is a quotation from somebody in, in uh, the sports technology learning class. It says, earlier, I used to think that computer science was only about programming and coding and nothing else at all. 
based on the class we had, it has actually helped in finding the truer picture of what computer science really is and where it can be used. Support technology one of the major applications that has uses in computer vision and deep learning. Um, I'll skip over this one. I never thought I had much interest in this, but I see it differently now and as something that is worth taking a look at for the possible future. I think the last two, I always, I was always intimidated by computer science, but this class definitely helped expand my interest and in understanding of various aspects of applications of computer science. I thought computer science was simply impossible coming into this class. This class opened my eyes to realize that it is possible. Uh, it is not as difficult as I thought, uh, thought coming in. So this sort of suggests that depending on how we end up structuring these environments, we can start to see shifts in not just you know, what happens in a specific class, but also how people start to more broadly see the space of, of, of computer science. Um, these directions of the work, I really wanna do more work of studying using multimodal data, how it is that people are experiencing and demonstrating learning within, um, within, within the space. And so that's some of the what's coming up in, uh, in year four, so in, in two years for this specific for this specific proposal. Um, and then also doing some work around developing new youth sports technology. So one of the things that you've know, definitely observed is that a lot of the technologies that are currently out there, sports wearables, are really de designed for professional athletes. They're not designed for student athletes, for, for young, for kids in mind. Um, so one of the directions that we're probably gonna go with some of the work is thinking about ways that we can um, design some, some, new, some new types of technologies. Um, and also think about ways that we can design some more, some more accessible technologies. So I think that's what definitely one of the other things that comes up, especially in the context of, of, of sports, of which of the, what are the type of technologies that can really help things be more accessible. Um, so just to conclude, so right, my lab is really thinking about uh, inclusion along these three different dimensions of multiple learning, multiple interface, and multiple analytics. Um, we're really trying to answer some of these different questions related to our work. Um, and just to note again, that inclusion really spans across a lot of different areas. Uh, and it can show up within our within our computer science space in, in a number of different ways. Um, some of that can be in designing the actual learning experience. Some of it can be the sort of pedagogic strategies that we're using, the policies that we're using within the class, the actual interfaces and tools that we make available for people to design and build with, um, and also in the ways that we evaluate, the ways that we go about assessing and what we end up assessing or evaluating within those learning environments. Um, hopefully, Sports Sense will, will give you somewhat of a sense of um, some of the different layers that we can think about uh, as relates to as relates to uh, inclusion. All right. So with that, uh, I will close and open up for any questions people might have. Marcella, we'll start with your room, and then we'll jump to Zoom if there are. making these technologies um, more accessible and available to a multiple community, especially those from our Latinx communities. I think a lot of times, whether it's um, accurate or not, when we see like um, technologies like computer vision or like, you know, uh, uh, people wonder like, how are these technologies um, in the price point? Yeah, so cost is a huge one. Um, the first time we did our sport, oh, let me go back to the microphone, sorry. The first time we did our sports center data in motion program, we did this program for uh, a group that was primarily, was about 20, 25 black girls. Um, and we showed up with 150 to $250 smartwatches that they used. And you know, they enjoyed the watches, um, but it quickly became apparent that like that was not the right design choice in terms of cost. And so we've actually shifted um, and actually in response to that, because part of the situation we saw there was that many of those students didn't have a watch, period. Uh, and so to now show up and they're using this $200, $200 watch, not the way to go. Um, so we shifted this past summer, we actually ended up giving away uh, sort of like thirty or forty dollars smartwatches to all to the participants that that were in our program. Part because we think they should have a watch and be able to have access to using those things. But we've also shifted to really only using low cost tech. So these microbits are twenty dollars. 
Um, the Play Impossible Game Ball, even though this thing retails, like when, when the company is trying to sell it on uh, Apple, they were retailing for $100. We normally, I mean, the last batch I got, I got for $15 each. Um, so just to say that, yeah, the cost is, is one of those things that we are, we're definitely kind of like, let's not get things that aren't going to be accessible to people. Um, and even similarly, the computer vision apps that we've been using, the ones we've been using have been, have been free. The other thing I'll say about this is that one of the things that we do within our program is we will show students some of these different commercial devices, and then we'll actually teach them how to replicate those. So we had one of the one of the devices that was shown was something that you put on your arm that sort of lets you know when your arm is at the right angle to take a shot. Uh, we did a we did one program with the inventor of that technology, who's a, a black guy who was out in uh, uh, in New York. He came and talked to them about technology. Two weeks later, we showed them how to replicate that same thing using the BBC micro bit. Um, so part of it is we like to show them these things, but then also start to break it down so then they can actually go and create their own and be very explicit um, that, you know, the technology that that you can buy is great. Um, but when you actually make it, there's actually things enhancement we, we can add that actually go above and beyond that having sort of open APIs, for example, it, it can be really, really useful. So cost is cost is definitely a big one that we're that we're thinking about. Um, get caught up on your latest Marcel. You're always such a creative and generative thinker. It's very inspiring. Um, and I particularly like this most recent project just because you're doing some, as a culture person, you're doing some really interesting culture hacking and sort of boundary work. Um, and I was sort of curious, like in the space of kind of culturally responsive or culturally sustaining approaches, I think there's sort of one design direction that's really about centering around the minoritized or marginalized um, culture and interests. And then there's other approaches that like I've been curious about are more like contact zones or cross-cultural communication where you have mixed cultural or ability um, groups intersecting and trying to cross-pollinate. And I'm curious if that, like, as you think of this, area in bringing like student athletes and so on into computer science like how do you manage that is it about centering around the identities and interests of the athletes is it about mixing um if it's about mixing like what are the interesting problems and tensions that you've encountered i'm just really curious to hear about the culture bits because you're in a sort of uh hybrid zone yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is really interesting because the sports and stuff started because I was visiting middle school classrooms and came across a number of um, both black and brown boys and girls who were really, really into sports. And they would, like, any project they were working on in their class, they were trying to connect to sports. And so we said, let's try to come up with some more authentic, um, authentic connections. Um, but then... You know, as you start to develop it out, it's like this is not just relevant to black and brown boys and girls, or even non-binary uh, black and brown youth. Um, and I think there has been a tension, and in, in the work that we that we've done, we have been intentional about elevating black and brown inventors. Like that's something that we have definitely been very intentional about about trying to do and bring up questions of sort of accessibility, uh, etc. Um, but I think. We've also been like wrestling with some of that tension of how do we go about how do we go about doing this in a way that that can be cross cultural, but at the same time set up a space to elevate, you know, honestly we want to elevate multiple cultures, multiple identities, um, and so in so much as that, I, I mean, I think we try to carve out a space where people can bring can bring various aspects of who they are. Um, to that space in a way that 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 can kind of support the cross cultural aspect, of it. but I, I, in truth, like I don't I don't know. I think we're we're still kind of wrestling with that tension. So one of the things I'll say is um, the Sports Sense Sports Sense project is also connected to an initiative called Black Kids Predict, which is an initiative. Um, and actually, right now, Black Kids Predict is primarily they're doing Sports Sense. It's basically like one and the same kind of um, kind of kind of uh, curriculum. But I think 
I guess from so far what we've seen is that it, it, it has not been exclusive, right? We have a lot of kids who are participating in these Black Kids Predict activities and really resonating with many of the different, um, many of the different activities. To that point, though, it's like we did design this, really thinking about Black and Brown youth, but it has started to transition and become something that is much more of a kind of a, a cross-cultural space that, I don't know, in some sense, like, the youth see it, they're like youth of all races and ethnicities seem to connect with it. I think sometimes the parents are kind of like, wait, this is called Black Kids Predict. What is that? Does like, does that mean our, our kid doesn't get to participate and so on? But the youth have definitely been, they've definitely been into it. Um, and I guess the other part is we're also trying to be expansive in how we think about sports. Uh, you know, some people initially think about this, okay, so like dance doesn't count. Like, no, 100% dance, yoga, like just going outside for a walk, like all those things um, sort of fall into the fold of just having people think about, think about movement, think about, about and space, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I don't know if I have, a, I don't know if I have a, like a, a super. It's interesting though that, I do, I'm not completely up on the research here, but I think that there's a fairly good body of research that shows that athletics are actually a zone where you do get friendships that cross like racial and social economic lines because there's a shared activity and interest. Um, so it's kind of interesting that as a domain to work in versus computer science, for example, where you see those stark differences, but there's a lot of cultural tension, as you notice, between historically the kids who identify as athletes and the kids that identify as nerds. So that boundary feels really challenging, even though athletics is a zone where we have seen cross-cultural and cross-racial kind of connections. So it's just interesting. I think it's a really smart choice of a domain to look at. I mean, I think within that too, there's also questions around like who is allowed to embrace the academic identity who is allowed to embrace the athletic identity i mean i think oftentimes asian american may both show up in a space want to engage in the athletics and someone looks at them like you're not supposed to be here you're supposed to be in this other state and in this, this, this other space uh and so really trying to yeah set up a space where people can bring those different um identities to bear i think is that's that's the hope. That's what we're, we're we're really trying to be able to push for, and even be able to have some of these tough conversations. Like in the at my undergraduate and grad class, we try to have some of these conversations, um, and really try to start to dig into some of these issues um, because they're out there, uh, and I think they they're worth talking about. There's a hand, yeah. Yeah, last one, last question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I guess they on that. Like. If you think about like you know the structures of the student pilot school that there is in like policy uh, enabling those kind of techniques, how do you um, try to interface with um, that as well? Like um, mitigating issues. So yes and no. The way I've been thinking about this as of late is on a couple of different levels. One of them is in terms of um, policies in schools. So one of the things, you know, people who are student athletes or even not, student athletes are all oftentimes expected to maintain a certain grade point average. And so one of my questions is what does, what does uh, those sort of grade point average requirements signal to people about athletics versus, versus schoolwork, athletics versus scholastics? Um, and if there's issues there, the other place where I end up, I'm starting to think and do more is in the context of coaching. Um, again, I, out of curiosity, how many of you all participated in, in some sort of youth or uh, youth athletics or any sort of youth sports? How many of you guys felt like you had negative coaching experiences in the context of youth sports? So this is another one of my, another one of my concerns um, is that I think there's times that the context of sports can promote a certain level of anti-intellectualism um, that if we can get coaches to be really embrace 
academics more, or at least sort of show more of a geeky side, for example, that we can start to shift some people's perhaps implicit mindset around the sort of different or the sort of separation between, you know, very typical jock nerd. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the areas where I'm also thinking about, about policy and also thinking about what was it look like for all coaches to go through some sort of training around positive enforcement, positive reinforcement with, with the student athletes. Um, and those sorts of guidelines at the state level or even at the national level to ensure that um, one, the, the emotional health of these student athletes is being taken care of, but also that they're getting um, a different picture uh, and really that they're, they're getting some reinforcement from these role models, these coaches around um, the importance and perhaps even the, you know, the, the alignment between um, computing and, and sports. And so that's, that's one of the directions where, you know, trying to think about, about moving and actually I'm currently working with a couple of different sports, um, youth sports teams um, to really start to push on those things and think about what are those, what are those practices? What are the things that student athletes are experiencing within those spaces and how can we go about trying to, trying to shift those and then subsequently come up with actual policies um, to, to change that at a, a larger scale. It's time to go out and have some snacks. So let's thank Marcelo for wanting to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. If anybody wants to test out the game ball, I have it connected. You guys should definitely need a snack and whatnot. But yeah, you guys, if anybody wants to test out the game ball, feel free. Um, here's a quick. Oh, you got the other one? Yeah. <laughs> so here's just one of the things like as you take the ball and throw it. Uh, it'll give you real-time data about how the ball is moving. Um, so just 